It is my pleasure to introduce our final conversation of the day, being trans in tech. E.C. Pizarro III is an award-winning brand designer and digital artist, the executive director of Trans Tech Social Enterprises, and the founder of Marsha's Web, a resource directory for TLGBTQIA communities that centers Black, Indigenous, and people of color transgender folks, intersex, and GNC business owners or organizations. EC has been in the design industry for over 12 years and works with entrepreneurs and Fortune 500 companies alike. For his clients, he creates timeless branding and seamless digital content that drives confidence in their brand and fosters a foundation for success. Passionate about his people and his purpose, EC is a professional that is dedicated to using his talent and voice to create a new temperature in the industry for emerging designers. Welcome, EC. It's always a pleasure to share virtual space with you. Um, and I definitely encourage you all to check out some of the conversations that we've had at Power to Fly. EC, I'm, I just sent you an email because we need some chit chat time as well. So thank you so much. And joining EC in conversation, we have Power to Fly's Senior Events and Communities Lead. And again, one of the masterminds behind today's summit. Rob, take it away. Thank you, Mariella uh, and EC. Thank you for joining us again. I've had the pleasure to speak with you a, a couple of times in the past on camera and a few times off camera. Well, we're always on camera these days, so, but you know, <laughs> yeah. some of them are recorded and some of them are not. I guess we'll say it that way. Yeah, um, some on the record, some off. <laughs> exactly. And I also know like this is a super busy time for you because, you know, as the executive director of Trans Tech, we've got New York City Pride March next weekend. And I, I want to hear a little bit more about that because I know you all are very involved and it's busy time. So thank you. Um, and, you know, I want to get into some topics here. But first off, I want to hear a little bit more also about you know, your journey. So can you tell us a bit more about your journey as a trans person working as a designer? Yeah, no problem. Um, so I took an untraditional route when it came to being a designer. I actually went to college and started off as an engineering major. Um, I love math and science, um, but it was kind of boring. Um, I was good yes. at it, but yeah. I was on a sleep day class. It was very boring. <laughs> um, so I transitioned. Um, to the art space, to design, um, and really found my niche of, of the ways I can use my, my skills with math and science um, and really execute clean design, digestible design. Um, my niche is like brand design and corporate design. Worked in corporate America for about eight years. I've uh, been a freelancer entrepreneur for the last two um fully self-employed um anytime somebody asks i give all of the credit to trans tech for that um it's all about the mindset switch of realizing like th that your skills are enough um and you are the prize not the company or the job that they offer you um so that's a little bit about me i, I manage a few brands um blackhealthmatters.com wayneymoonweddings.com um, okay, those are only two that don't have non-disclosures. Um, no, no, but... yeah. Do you, as a designer, do you sometimes see, uh, I would imagine when you see some people's logos, does it just like, oh my gosh, I wish I could jump in there and help them? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of times that happens. Um, I think one of the things, though, that I've learned throughout the years is the autonomy to say no. There's a, mm -hmm. a power saying no. Um, everything or every client that comes to me that wants work or wants design work doesn't necessarily mean I'm the best designer for them. Um, if you're not ready to build a brand, then I'm not really the best designer for you because I think about the overall aspect of how you look, how you make your consumers feel, um, what that presence looks like on social media. I, look, I think about all of that when I, when I say a brand. Um, so that's one of the things where I'm like, mm, I don't create logos, I create brands because a mm. logo is a individual thing, right? And a brand, you know, Target, the logo is the Target, right? But the brand of Target is the red dot, knowing that you're going to go into Target and you may have just went in there for some soap and you walk out with soap, hangers, and all of this other stuff, and you fall into the Target trap of, I only came in here to spend $3 yeah. and I walked out with 50, I've spent 50, right? Um, 
so that that's what I'm most passionate about is that the brand and what the branding is for companies and organizations. Um, I really like branding nonprofits, um, especially those that are led by marginalized communities, because I feel like that is what separates um, these larger organizations from a lot of the grassroots organizations. It's not capacity. Um, it's not a lack of resources. It's how you're presenting yourself to donors and funders and mm -hmm. grants and all of those different things. And that's what really, really helps people stand out. Yeah, totally. Completely agree. Um, yeah. And then you, you also say that you aim to create a new temperature in the industry for emerging designers. And I know TransTech has been so helpful to you as a designer as well. So I'm hoping you can also tell us a little bit more by what you mean by this and, and how do you go about creating that new temperature for emerging designers? Yeah, no problem. So for me, I like to mentor um, younger designers. Um, a lot of designers that are coming up, they'll ask me their my opinion on different projects, different concepts. Um, so I really like to provide that feedback for those that are, you know, open and welcoming to that. Additionally, I think there's, I don't know if you hear the sirens, sorry, I'm in the city. <laughs> um, but also I think there's a level of bringing your full authentic self to the design space um, and to tech. Um, there are certain things that I bring up with my clients that they've never heard before. And that's because I am thinking about ways to make it accessible to the people that I know, to the people that I'm in community with. Um, so you only really know what you surround yourself with. So when you surround yourself with a diverse group of individuals with mm -hmm. all different accessibility needs, there's a different level of design thinking that comes in with that. Um, so that that's what I mean. We're really creating that temperature of really bringing up different designers who are really thinking about um, people that are colorblind when they're creating something, mm. um, thinking about <clears throat> making sure that their graphics have alt text. Um, if they're working on a website, having as much live text as possible instead of creating graphics with text on top of it, because we know that the readers for people who are um, who are hard of seeing, that reader doesn't read images. It only reads live text. Mm -hmm. So those little small things to really, they really make a big difference um, because the more people that can consume your design, more people that your design is accessible to, the more people that you reach and the more people that you can connect to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just did a big accessibility study of our site. And then, you know, it's astounding when, you know, there's things that you miss and things you think that you're covering and, you know, there is so much. And as you're saying, like the more people that can be exposed to your design or your website or your product, you know, obviously that's what we are all looking for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious too, you know, for other people who want to follow in your footsteps to make that transition from the corporate world to the freelance world, you know, what's the number one thing that you would, what's the number one piece of advice you would give people in that position? Or what's the thing that you wish you had gone back and like someone had told you when you were making that jump? Um, get your systems in place of like really keep track of what services you're providing and what steps it takes you to get all the way from the first contact to the end result. Um, when I first started, I was just kind of doing and I wasn't keeping track of the steps. Um, and then I got busy and I had to keep track of the steps because I had to hire an assistant to fill in the gaps. Um, and I think the other thing that no one told me that I wish somebody did is like, no one's going to believe in your dream as much as you do. No one. Um, even people that mean well, people that love you, people that care about you. Um, if freelancing and entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurship or contracts is really where you want to go, don't quit on yourself. Don't quit on yourself. Um, there's, there's ups, there's downs, just like with everything else but you really, really have to be all in and bet on yourself. Mm -hmm. um, my philosophy is if I'm not gonna bet on myself, who else is? 
Yeah. You know, um, the first year was very difficult because I didn't transition from a place of like, oh, I have all of this savings. I can do it. Um, that's not where it came from. <laughs> I was actually very broke. Um, It was at the top of the pandemic um, and I saw agencies closing and I have friends who are working in different sectors and they're like, I need a graphic for this. I need a graphic for this. The agency is closed. And I started to tap into my networks Mm. and I was like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing something here. Um, And I made such a good impression on my work ethic, my communication, how much I was bringing to the table that a lot of these people are still my clients to this day. And they didn't go back to the agency once the agency was open. They were like, no, we're going to we're going to stick with Edward. Um, he does great work and <laughs> we're, we're going to go there. So I think that was one of um, of all of the things like you really have to bet on yourself, because if I didn't bet on myself in that moment, I probably wouldn't be in the place I am right now. Yeah. Um, Because I had that time, you know, me and my friends say it's hard when you're hungry, right? Mm -hmm. And at a time where, you know, a a secure, long-standing contract creeped back up and was like, hey, we need you for a couple of weeks. Can you do this? Um, And then I started looking at my clients and I was actually going to lose money going back to them um <clears throat> and moving from a scarcity mindset I was like I need to do both because I don't know when I don't know when um and the best decision I made was to not go back um and I didn't and I didn't lose anything I actually gained a lot more um and I, I didn't gain it in the moment but it was definitely like things started coming in abundance because I put the energy out there. Like, this is what I mm-hmm. want to do. And this is where I'm putting all of my energy. Uh, once I did that, it was, I was just getting so many clients where I had to tell people, no, not because I didn't want to do it, but because I didn't have the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So- don't they say like, it's like the roads that you don't take are the things that you regret the most, not necessarily when you fall on your face. That's when you really learn sometimes. But, you know, if you yeah. don't take that risk, then that's what you're going to be, you know, years exactly. from now going, ah, I wish I had done that. Exactly. Uh, well, exactly. And- in addition to your design career, which sounds like it's going amazing, you are also the executive director of TransTech Social Enterprises. And, you know, you mentioned TransTech also helping you, you know, on your career journey as well. Um, we've been big supporters of TransTech. We uh, were, you know, honored to have sponsored your recent summit. And we're also giving uh, our merch proceeds to TransTech. So if everyone go to our merch store and buy a shirt, you're going to be help out their organization. But you know, let's back up and can you tell us a little bit more about who TransTech is and what you all are working on? Yeah, no problem. So TransTech is an incubator for LGBTQ, <clears throat> excuse me, plus talent. Uh, we center unapologetically transgender, non-binary and gender non-conforming folks, um, even more specific Black trans women that are currently or formerly engaged in sex work. Uh, we were founded by Angelica Ross, um, Candy Ferocity, American Horror Story, Pose. Um, she actually taught herself to code um, online. Uh, she learned graphic design skills. She learned how to um, edit websites. And she used that to get herself out of sex work. So she went from being on the sites to being able to code the sites and retouch um, photos for different um, models on the sites. So she took that framework and was like, well, if I did this, like, couldn't other people do this as well? Um, So TransTech, we are currently sitting at 2,188 members globally, um, which has doubled since I've been in C. So we have a whole lot of members um, and we provide resources for free for our members. So we like to say TransTech is for everybody. um, And it's for everybody that one wants, wants to do more, wants to learn more and understands that we center transgender people in our work. Um, And we, we center the most marginalized unapologetically. 
Uh, we have some great programs. Um, like Rob, like you said, we just had our, our summit back in March. Uh, we're in the process of planning for our next summit, which will be March 31st to April 3rd. Um, Power to Fly will be the first to know we're <laughs> actually um, in uh, conversations with having a pitch contest this year um, with a venture capital fund. We will also be providing programming for our members to prepare them for that pitch contest. So that's the one thing with Trans Tech is that <clears throat> we meet people where they are. So we're not assuming that you have anything that you need to get in to tech. We're asking you like, where do you wanna go? And we're looking for all of the pieces of the puzzle to get you there. Um, whether it is you want to be a social media influencer and you need to figure out how to create graphics and edit your own videos until you get to a place where you can outsource that thing. Um, <clears throat> so TransTech is great. Um, just to say like the power of the membership, I was a member. Um, I started yeah. off at Volunteer in 2017 and I literally just came to Volunteer. I was like, Angelica, you need me help with anything? I'm a graphic designer, I can help. Um, and then in 2020, was it 2019, um, Angelica announced a community advisory board, um, which I sit on with um, some great people, Ronnie Parks, Ariah Lester, um, Safi Mojidi, uh, Angelica sits on the board, Mateo um, and Joey Grant. And we sat on that board. We were in the process of hiring an ED. Um, we were doing some trial runs and things weren't, things weren't going right. Um, and just me being the personality that I am, like I just started putting all the pieces together. I was like, this is what we're missing. This is where we need to be. Here's how we need to call them to the carpet. And then next thing you know, I'm getting a text message like, I think you should be. <laughs> You're in charge. And I was like, wait. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? I've never, I've never done this before. Um, so I came on last year in October as interim. Um, and right before the summit, you know, <clears throat> we had secured funding from we had secured support from Google.org for our grow program, which is gaining real opportunities at will. Um, they've they came in at a very big amount for three years to support us getting transgender and gender nonconforming folks ready to enter into the tech field. So it's a career readiness where we offer um, soft skills. You can up upskill um, resume writing. Uh, interview skills. We have IT recruiters that are um, through our partners that will look at your resume, give you direct feedback, hiring managers that you can do mock interviews with, um, salary negotiation. And we were really trying to um, infiltrate the system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as I've gotten into this role, I've realized that a lot of organizations want trans people in their space, yeah. especially in um, they just don't know how to go about it. Um, they don't have the policies in place. They need to understand, you know, what will make a, a truly um, empowering environment where people can just show up and do really great work, mm -hmm. right? Um, so having those different conversations with organizations, um, we've connected some of our members with full-time opportunities that have really, you know, changed their lives. And the reality is, is a lot of these opportunities that are coming in, like they're like, we start at $80,000 a year. We start at 75,000. Oh, the minimum we start at is six figures. And for trans people, like that is life changing mm -hmm. amounts of money. Um, when you think about the average salary for trans people, especially for um, people of color, black, indigenous folks, it's under $20,000 a year, you know? So like that literally can change someone's life um, and not just change their life, but change their mindset, change from going from a survival to mm -hmm. a thriving. Um, so, you know, long short, that's what- uh, <laughs> No, trans, no, that's amazing. Uh, I, I, and, and thank you for sharing like those stats because I think that is so eye-opening. And it's also a great transition into a question we had from the audience, actually, because Corey is asking, I'm looking to leave my current position and go into a new career in coding. I'm currently pre-trans. Is it, quote unquote, safe or advisable to disclose that in job interviews? It depends. It, it really depends. I would look up the company, see what their corporate equality index is with HRC. 
Um, a lot of companies have where you can put a preferred name on your application and only your birth name or given name is on like your tax paperwork and payroll and things like that. So really do your research on the different organizations that you're interviewing with, um, you know, depending on how, how comfortable you are. Right. Um, disclosing, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not binary. I'm, you know, transgender. Um, I, I like to say, like, once you have in your mind that you know that you identify as trans, there's no uh, there's no barrier there of you identifying as trans, mm -hmm. um, whether you're medically transitioning or not. Um, if you say you are, you are. Um, and that's, that's a lot of the root work that we do. Um, at Trans Tech with our partners is like, hey, that's great that you're accessible to a guy like me who can move in throughout space and I'm not assumed to be trans when I walk into the space or queer, but I'm more concerned about the person that is visibly queer. Mm -hmm. how, how are you going to treat them and how can they show up in, in the space? Um, I would also, you know, look into their dress code. Dress codes tell you a lot about where companies stand. Um, if their just dress code is gendered, that may be a red flag of mm -hmm. whether you want to disclose um, that you know you're in the early stages of your transition. Um, a lot of companies have gone away with gendered um, dress codes for this very reason. But that that's one of the main things that I will look for is look for the corporate equality index with HRC see where they stand there, um, and then do do some digging, you know, look on Glassdoor, um, look on LinkedIn, see, you know, who follows the page, what pages they follow, do they follow any specific LGBT pages and organizations, because that really tells you a lot. Um, you know, we're in Pride Month, so everybody's logo yeah. is rainbow currently, right? So see what they say July 1st. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. See what they say about LGBT people July 1st. Yeah, or who um, maybe not, they, they give money to, too, because that's often right. a thing that you can find out. And, you know, if they're giving money to, you know, the Trevor Project, okay, but maybe if they're giving money to other organizations that we won't mention, you know, that might be a big red flag right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really, really look into that. And then also look into their employee resource groups. Mm, yes. Um, the employee resource groups are really powerful um, and they're huge advocates for employee rights at these companies. So look to see what type of employee resource groups that they, that they have. If they do not have a pride LGBT employee resource group, that would be a huge red flag. If you see they have one for women, they have one for minorities, they have one for military, they have all of these different things, but they don't have an LGBT one, that lets you know that one, we, we know from the numbers, like there's likely LGBT employees there, um, but two, they may not feel comfortable to be out and mm -hmm. that gives you a huger, like, I can't bring my full self to work. Um, and I'm a huge advocate for being able to bring your full self to work. Because um, when you're able to bring your full self and you're able to bring those full ideas, you are an asset to the company. And companies are now realizing when you're able to do that, it actually increases profit on their end and productivity and mm -hmm. retention. Yes, totally. Yeah, I think those th those are all amazing pieces of advice. And kind of on a similar note, I'm curious, have there been ways that you have seen or members of Transsec that have seen that, you know, actual examples of why, you know, te tech specifically might sometimes be less accessible to trans professionals? And are there things that companies can do to make to be more accessible? Yeah, so one of the one of the huge barriers is they go education. You know, they're instantly, oh, we need a bachelor's degree. Oh, we need a certificate from a boot camp. Um, and boot camps are expensive. College degrees are expensive. Um, so that barrier of education really, really, really harms not just trans people, but any person that's living within the margins that can't afford that type of education. Um, at Trans Tech, we work with our partners and the um, different companies that want to hire within our membership where we're negotiating that we don't post any jobs that require uh, a bachelor's degree, associate's mm -hmm. degree, 
and things like that. Um, we're asking them directly like, hey, we have access to the LinkedIn Learning Library. If we curate these courses and they've completed this, will this substitute for the work experience or for the education experience that you're looking for? Um, so I think th that is the huge barrier, but if a lot of, um, one of our partners that we worked with, they actually work with us specifically to get um, trans people into their apprenticeship program. Um, and their program is a 12 week program. They pay the employees for it. It wasn't a public opportunity. They were super intentional of just reaching out to their partners that they had. Um, and there was no education requirement. There was mm -hmm. no boot camp requirement. It was very much like, we want to see how you think mm -hmm. and we'll teach you everything else. And I think that's the one thing with tech and why you see such an influx of just people in general transitioning into tech. You're seeing a lot of teachers transition into tech um, because of yeah. the pandemic. And that's because a lot of these tech jobs, there's so much tech out there. They can't expect you to know everything. Each company uses something different. So they're literally like, do, can you can you follow instructions? Can you um, can you figure if we show you how to work something? Can you figure it out? And they provide on the job training and they pay you for it. So a lot of it is really like, will you fit in with the team? Are you going to be an asset? Um, you know, not being a yes individual to be able to push back and be like, actually, this may work better. Have you thought about this? Um, so th those are a few things that mm -hmm. um, could really help trans people entering in tech, as well as companies trying to uh, have a more gender expansive workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's all great advice. And everything you're saying is really resonating with our audience. Um, Yasmin is, is saying, wow, that average income for trans individuals is shocking. And totally it is. And, and absolutely, we need a seat at a table and have stakeholders that will advocate for employers which I totally agree. And I would imagine, I'm not going to put you on the spot to know, but I would imagine just like the number of trans executives in the C-suite, you know, CEOs, you know, of, of big, of large companies, I'm sure is, is pitiful. I'd imagine. It's, it's very few. It's very limiting. Um, and if you're talking about the demographics of what that looks like. A lot of C-suite trans individuals are white trans women mm -hmm. um, that have sometimes um, transitioned later in life. Um, so the dynamics of that, it doesn't really help the community, the most marginalized in the community because they may have gotten that position and been in that seat presenting as a cis white man, right? Um, whether gay or straight, that all, that gives you a certain level of privilege and access that necessarily a black trans woman um, wouldn't have mm -hmm. or a, a, a Hispanic non-binary individual mm -hmm. that's femme presenting wouldn't have. Um, so, you know, tech, we're, we're still trying to infiltrate um, everything and, you know, no matter how I identify, we center Black trans women with trans tech um, and our founder is CEO, uh, <laughs> no matter how busy she gets, because we understand the power of that. Um, and we also under, understand the power of us working together, um, a Black trans woman and uh, Afro-Latino trans man working together to center trans people in tech. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, and and Corey was also asking, I don't know if trans tech is really hiring, but Corey was asking, you know, about entry level coding positions. So, I mean, if, if you're if you're not specifically hiring, what advice would you give to someone who is an entry level coder who's trying to get out there in the world? Uh, one, join trans tech, uh, yeah. because we have a lot of opportunities that come in um, that are entry level. Um, trans tech is not currently hiring. Um, we are still growing. Um, we're in a lot of uh, leadership transition right now, and we are majority volunteer based. 
Um, but we have multiple, multiple companies that come in looking for entry level coders um, and not just companies. We have people, individuals, entrepreneurs that are looking for contractors, freelancers, mm -hmm. all of these different things. Um, so if you're trying to get your foot in the door, I would definitely say, you know, get get with one of these organizations, um, specifically TransTech. But there's a lot of organizations that center LGBT folks in tech. And, um, you know, we get job postings, we get all types of things. Um, I, I would say the one difference with trans tech is that we talk to these companies before we disseminate these jobs to our members because mm -hmm. we understand that we are working with a marginalized community. So there are certain questions that we're going to ask before we just send this out to our membership because y'all need a body. Totally. Um, because we don't want to harm community in that mm -hmm. process. And I would say, Corey, too, you know, like, just go to events, too. I mean, go to Trans Tech's um, Summit in March. Uh, check out Power to Fly's virtual job fair tomorrow. Go to our hackathon this weekend. You know, just, just soak it in, even if you're more of a passive uh, you know, viewer at first. You know, like, you can learn so much. You can meet, network, uh, all that. Um EC, we have to wrap it up, but um, I'd love for, you know, to end uh, by letting people know, you know, where they can find out more about you or contact you or TransTech. And also, uh, we didn't mention, but your CEO and founder, Angelica Ross, is actually hosting a viewing of the Pride March on TV this weekend, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So you can find TransTech, um, TransTech Social on all social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, you can find me uh, on there. Uh, my handles on social media are ECAP3. Those are my initials. So E-C-A-P-T-H-R-E-E. -E. I have a very long name. Um, and yeah, you can check out Angelica Ross. She will be on ABC on Sunday uh, for Pride being a co-host as well as on Friday morning, um, for those who have seen the press release from Pride Live, um, the Stonewall National Monument Visitor Center will be having their groundbreaking ceremony streamed on YouTube and trans tech curated trans and non-binary artists to create their first member card. Um, so that will be revealed during that time. Um, we have a great non-binary artist um, from Nebraska, so like middle America, uh, <laughs> created some really great artwork that'll be featured in the visitor center when it opens in 2024, and it will also be the first member card. So, you know, with trans tech, we get tech opportunities, but there are all types mm -hmm. of opportunities because of our connection um, and our leadership from Angelica Ross. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. As I said, I know this is a busy time of the year for you, but everyone check out Trans Tech. Uh, buy a shirt and you'll send some money their way. Uh, thank you again, EC, for your time. And Mariella, I'm going to throw it back to you to uh, take us home today. 